vulnerable community. Our mission is to equip the medical community with the language, with the knowledge to identify signs of genocide and to be able to speak up and to be able to fight to save lives, which is the essence of our oath to do no harm. We um, consider medicine as a social science and a political science. Medicine depends on freedom, human rights, the ability to have security in food, security in access to health, access to life. And we are seeing the decimation of all of that in Gaza. Uh, I want to point out uh, that in Gaza, the medical community became, or the international medical community became uh, the source for information that's coming from Gaza, the source of reliable information. So the medical community has become the witness to the genocide. Anyways, I want to go back to before she dies. She died of a septic shock, of a hyperglycemic ketoacidosis. She's a diabetic. In the siege of Gaza, she was struggling even before October 7th. She will have multiple episodes of those hyperglycemic attacks. She will go to the hospital and she will have an insulin drip. She's in the north. She and her husband did not migrate and evacuate to the south. They stayed there. And she had one of those episodes where her blood sugar was very high and she needed to go to the hospital. <laughs> While she's going to the hospital, an IDF soldier shot her. They shot her in the leg. She stopped bleeding. Her family tried to tell them that we're going to the hospital. They said, you're not going. She continued to bleed. They were able to control the bleed. And after seven hours, they let her go to the hospital. She went there, but unfortunately at the hospital, they were not able to do anything. She died right there. After a shahada, the only thing she said, and I was with them on the phone, very hard communication. The only thing she said, I am Samha. I forgive you. I was thinking why she chose that out of everything else that she could have said. And then when I analyzed it, I found that in somehow we're complicit. The bullet that she was shot by was an American bullet that I paid for with my own taxes. At the beginning of the war, my brother, the youngest brother, Muhammad, Allah was killed looking for water for his wife and his young children and his family. And our family continued to suffer throughout the genocide. We lost over 100 shuhada murders in this genocide. Now, from a medical perspective, Gaza before October 7th was a very difficult place to practice medicine. Just imagine after October 7th. Me and Dr. Nidal, we tried several times to go for medical missions, but SubhanAllah it didn't work for us. My wife was able to go there and I was with her almost on a daily basis. The situation there is unimaginable. It's something that cannot even, if somebody wants to 
write the worst scenario that can happen in a medical field, they will not come up with something that's happening in Gaza. And the tragedy is going on and on and on. Last week, my cousin, also he decided to stay in the north. They bombed his house. And he stayed under the rubble for over 12 hours. His son was within his arms. His son died. And it goes on and on and on. I saw children suffer life-changing injuries, forever maimed, forever disfigured, forever disabled. I witness pure evil at the hands of Israel. I witness families lose everything. And that's not a figure of speech, literally everything. I want you to close your eyes and I want you to take yourself to Gaza. Take your family with you, take your children with you, take your parents with you. Imagine receiving an Amber Alert on your phone, courtesy of the Israeli army, giving you an ultimatum. You have 24 hours to leave your home or stay and take your chances with the bombing. What do you do? What do you pack? Where do you go? Gas is too expensive. You can't take your car anywhere. Wherever you go is on foot and you can only take what you can fit in a backpack or luggage that you can carry. All the privileges we enjoy here and take for granted are now stripped from you. How do fathers feed their families? How do mothers care for their babies? Your baby once had a crib to sleep on, but now sleeps on a blanket on the ground, or maybe some folded cardboard to provide some cushion against the hard dirt beneath them. <laughs> Diapers, hygiene, all these basic human necessities are now considered luxuries. If you're lucky to take refuge at the hospital, you may be able to shower your children, but even that becomes degrading when you have to use a bidet hose in a public restroom without <laughs> soap or water to clean them. Consider the public health consequences of the lack of sanitary living spaces, coupled with mass, mass displacement. No toilet paper, no soap and water to wash your hands, no isolation of sick and contagious patients. How do you manage or contain the growing pile of garbage that's building up in these living spaces? I witnessed the healthcare system nearing obliteration. Out of the 30 plus previous hospitals that were present, only two were fully functioning at the time. Due to the inhumane blockade imposed by Israel, no adequate or significant aid was able to reach the people of Gaza. Consider your own home, your own office, your own business, not being resupplied for three months. Now extrapolate that to the consequences of healthcare if a hospital is not appropriately supplied. Semi-trucks loaded with aid are lined up for miles and miles outside the Rafah border waiting to enter. Hospitals dealing with dwindling supplies and the healthcare system crumbling. It was overrun and undersupplied. Consider your own local level one trauma center here in America, wherever you live. Most beds in level one trauma centers here are hold beds for around somewhere around a thousand patients. Consider the size of the hospital, consider the size of these medical complexes, how big they are. European Gaza Hospital where we stayed had only 300 beds designated for patients. Yet somehow 20,000 people were living in and around the hospital seeking refuge. Rooms typically meant for two patients are now holding up to six. With the hospital beyond capacity, patients are now stacked side by sides in hallways. As a physician, how do you track patients without designated room numbers? What if a patient's family member moves them from one part of the hallway to the other? What if a patient's chart gets lost in the mix? Simply being in the hospital no longer guarantees that you're going to receive medical care. Imagine your own local major hospital system. 
Now I want you to imagine literally stepping over refugees and people laying down in the lobby in order for you to enter the hospital, all for seeking shelter. Privacy no longer exists. With their homes destroyed after bombings, families now live with their injured loved ones in the hospital further overwhelming the system. With the lack of supplies, orthopedic surgical care was subpar. Expired equipment was frequently used. One plastic surgeon is expected to take care of an entire hospital of patients with complex wounds. Mangled arms and legs are held together with pins sticking out of the bone connected to bars and clamps, something called an external fixator, something, a technique we use here simply as a temporizing measure, but over there that's all they have left. Consider the case of one family we took care of, and this is just one. Imagine these are your children. Two kids both injured by the bombing. Six-year-old boy has a shrapnel injury to his hip, cutting the nerves and paralyzing his leg, leaving him with a large wound. His sister has it even worse. Over half the tissue around her hip has been uh, destroyed by the explosion and the bone is now sticking out of the skin. To make matters worse, a terrible infection sets in. Every other day she needs to go back to the OR for more and more surgery. And each day we cut away more skin, each day we cut away more muscle, each day we cut away more bone. How am I supposed to tell her father that his 12-year-old daughter now needs an amputation at the level of the hip to save her life? Again, this is just one of thousands of stories. Injuries, though complex but definitely fixable here in America, present surgeons in Gaza with a dilemma. Do we try to save this patient's leg with inadequate implants, inadequate supplies, put them through pain and suffering, and hope and wait that the leg will heal? Or do we perform an amputation right away, avoid all the trauma of repeat surgery, but now leave this patient without prosthetics to walk on afterwards? Consider the patient who was crushed so badly beneath the rubble, both of his legs needed amputations above the knee. You would think at least he got his surgery and at least he can start getting better, but how is this patient supposed to take care of himself? How is he supposed to keep his wounds clean without access to clean water, clean bandages, and sanitary living conditions? Unfortunately, he returns to us at the hospital with maggots growing, both, growing out of both of his legs. Because of the constant bombing, the healthcare system is solely focused on treating new injuries, acute trauma only. Doctors' offices are not open. There's no primary care, there's no preventative care. So all the people with chronic medical conditions, heart problems, lung problems, kidney problems, diabetes, cancer, all these patients are not receiving medication and care that they deserve and need. So if you're lucky enough to escape the bombing, your chronic medical condition will likely kill you in the long run. Despite this healthcare crisis, there's still a deafening silence from multiple national and international orthopedic organizations, including the Orthopedic Trauma Association, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, and the AO Foundation all of whom have released public statements and provided aid to other international atrocities but somehow remain silent about this one. Shame. Absolutely. Absolute shame. I leave you all with a call to action. We all have a role to play and a duty to help. I was lucky my ability as a surgeon may be apparent, but you may need to dig deep and realize your talents and skills. Your time to help may not be today, it may not be tomorrow, but the time will definitely come and we all need to be prepared. Your contribution may not involve healthcare, but it's still valuable. The aftershock of this genocide is coming and it's gonna hit us very hard. The waves of mental health trauma, the waves of debilitated patients needing recovery and coordinated care. Gaza will physically need to be rebuilt as the infrastructure has been destroyed. A growing generation in Gaza needs to be re-educated. An entire city, an entire society, needs to be restored from ashes and rubble. This is no easy task that one of us can do alone, but together, as a united community, we can make a difference. May God bless Gaza, and may God give us a day that we see a free Palestine. The only thing that keeps me going is um, my relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my family and friends um, also are supportive. So um, the people of Gaza, faith, that's all I can say, it's one word. They are so faithful, they, they know this is um, 
a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's what they were telling me. It's okay. And, and they were telling me, in Allah, like I'm the one crying and they're the one consoling me sometimes. Um, so they, I think they're using many of the tactics to just ignore everything. Um, they laugh, they try to laugh a lot. They uh, support each other. Um, that I'm in groups with them, like on WhatsApp, and, and they just joke a lot, and that helps them, I believe. But they're also extremely faithful. Um, they have strong faith, and that's what's keeping them together. I know this sounds kind of abrasive uh, to say and come off, but when, when the people of Palestine are dealing with a life and death basis on a minute by minute time schedule, you don't have time for depression. I mean, these people are literally fighting for their lives. They, they, they can't, I mean, they think about how they're gonna feed their children, how they're gonna take care. There's no time for depression in, in this thought. And so, uh, like Dr. Jamana had mentioned, a lot of times they were consoling us. I'm the one sitting crying in the OR because I'm thinking about what they're going through and they're the ones that are consoling me. So I, 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 don't know, I think when the dust settles, I think that's really when the mental health, when people are going to finally realize they can take a breather and settle down and relax. Uh, I think that's when, when the wave of the mental health crisis is really going to start hitting everyone hard. And, and, and it's great that you bring that up because that's something that you can easily provide in a telehealth setting. You know, you don't need to, you don't need to travel there. And so this is just one of the avenues that you're blessed with that you can help the people. And I'm sure other people can help, uh, you know, from the safety of our homes where we can still lend a helping hand to the people of Gaza however we can. I'm just gonna add to that biggest uh, crisis that we have experienced. Uh, as Palestinians, um, are, there are many atrocities in the world, but this hits home. Uh, the way we deal with it is we work and we try to keep up uh, fighting for the people who are losing their lives every day, 100% of the time. Now, uh, for mental health of um, the healthcare workers in uh, Palestine, and that's also the West Bank and the East Jerusalem and Gaza. Uh, we, are, we keep talking about Gaza because what is happening there is astronomical, but it's what's happening in uh, the rest of Palestine is not far behind. So everyone needs uh, support and needs help. For mental health, uh, pro, uh, uh, we really, uh, whoever tries to do that has to be trauma informed and has to be um, skilled and has to have a deep understanding of what it means to be in the middle of genocide and what it means to be in the middle of apartheid occupation and discrimination. It is not for everyone. And uh, there are some of our colleagues, uh, Dr. Khouri is here, she works with Gaza Mental Health. Reach out to her. Oh, she's right there. <laughs> yes. Uh, she, she works closely with um, Gaza Mental Health. Please speak to her. She's also starting a campaign for children in Palestine. Uh, we have a table for Doctors Against Genocide. We have a card that has the information for Dr. Uh, Khouri um, campaign. Uh, we need a lot of help to make this a uh, big campaign to save the children in Gaza. Not another child, a child, not a target. These are the names that we, you will see for this campaign. Uh, and we need it to be amplified as much as possible and as soon as possible. For any information, come to our table, talk to us, we are there.